الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث حديث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we begin by praising Allah we praise him we seek his help and we ask for his forgiveness we seek refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our evil actions whomsoever Allah guides there is none to misguide and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray there is none to guide and i testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he is the servant of Allah and his final messenger after that the best speech is the book of Allah and the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the worst of all the affairs are those matters that have been newly introduced into the religion and all of the newly introduced matters in the religion of Islam are innovations bid'ah and all of the innovations are misguidance all of the misguidance is going astray and all the going astray is in the fire <coughs> rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated to us and mentioned the case of a good sitting companion and an evil companion a good friend and a bad friend and he gave an example a similitude an example that the example of the good companion is the example of the perfume seller if one of us was to live and to stay in the house of a perfume seller even if we did not buy some perfume from that man we would still come smelling from his house of perfume and the example of an evil companion is that of the blacksmith so if you stay in the house of the blacksmith even if the blacksmith does not drop on your clothes some coal or some fire and burn you then most certainly you will come smelling of smoke <coughs> this my brothers and sisters in islam may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon you is an observed fact of human behavior the people who you mix with the the people who you take as your companions the environment that surrounds you will influence you and will affect you without a doubt this is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that every child every child is born upon the fitra the natural disposition and the natural inclination to be good and to worship allah hanifan but the shayateen the devils 
amongst mankind in the jinn or their parents made them a Jew or a Christian or a fire worshipper so the natural condition of the human being is to be inclined to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone but the environment changes that and causes someone to actually be the opposite to make shirk with Allah to set up rivals to Allah which is the greatest oppression the greatest wrongdoing and the greatest tyranny and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam warned us be careful who you take as your friend because you will take your deen from your friend you will take your religion you will take your way of life from your friend and this is one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has warned us in his book do not take the disbelievers as your awliya do not take the disbelievers as your awliya do not take the Jews and the Christians or the mushrikeen as your awliya do not prefer them to the believers do not prefer their company to the company of the believers do not take them as your and what is the word awliya what does it mean it has a meaning of friendship close friendship it has the meaning of your advisor your protector the awliya your wali that is the one who you go to you seek protection from you seek help from you seek aid from you seek advice from when you have a problem it is the one who is your intimate friend and your protector from whom you seek advice the one who is close to you and you are close to them and Allah has forbidden the Muslim the believer from taking the unbeliever as their awliya Allah has forbidden us from having that relationship with the unbelievers whether it is us individually as individuals or as nations or as nations it is extraordinary to find how many of the Muslim nations boast and say how America they are our awliya, our allies, our friends how Britain, France, Germany and Australia and other countries they are our friends and our allies and in fact they will state their enmity and hatred for their own Muslim brothers and they will state their friendship for the disbelievers whereas in fact my brothers and sisters in Islam after the issue of Tawheed and Shirk after the issue of Tawheed and Shirk which is the most widely discussed topic in the Quran most verses in the Quran the greatest number of verses in the Quran could deal with the topic of Tawheed and Shirk that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about Surah Al-Ikhlas it is one-third of the Quran 
the next most widely discussed topic in the Quran and that has the most number of verses dedicated to it after the issue of Tawheed and Shirk is the issue of Wallah and Bara. The issue of who we should be allied to and who we should be at enmity with. Who are our friends and who are our enemies. However, when you look at the state of the Muslims, you will see that if they are ignorant about Tawheed and Shirk, it is not surprising to find they are ignorant about the issue of Wala and Bara. It is not surprising to find that they are also ignorant about the issue of who are our true allies and who are our true enemies. And there is a hadith of the Prophet wasallam where he heard what he saw and listened to one companion praying. In the first raqa, this companion recited Surah Al-Ikhlas. And the Prophet wasallam said, this is one who knows his Lord. This is one who knows his Lord. <coughs> and in the second raqa, he recited Surah Al-Kafirun. And the Prophet wasallam said, This is one who knows his deen. This is one who knows his deen. This is one who knows his religion. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Qul ya ayyuha al-kafirun. لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم آبدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم آبدون ما أعبد لكم دينكم واليدين. This is one who understands his deen because the basis of Islam is. That it is the only deen and the only religion, the only way of life that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the deen in the Allah islam Verily the deen, the way of life, the religion with Allah is Islam. It is the only way of life acceptable to Allah. And whoever chooses another way of life, another religion, it will never be accepted from them and in the next life they will be from the losers. They will be from the eternal inhabitants of hellfire. So it is impossible for a Muslim to believe in the unity of religions. Indeed whoever claims that the Jew and the Christian are our brethren in faith has without doubt made a statement of clear kufr, of clear rejection of the most basic verses of the Quran. They have rejected the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have not understood this deen. Why and what is the wisdom therefore of Allah prohibiting us from taking the Jews and the Christians and the disbelievers and the mushrikun as our awliya? I was once asked this question by some children in Sri Lanka in a Muslim school and the Muslim school had some non-Muslim teachers and I had to answer this question in front of all of them it was quite delicate and then I thought of an answer I said even if the person who is not a Muslim loves you 
And you will certainly find that there are non-Muslims who will love you. And they will love you for being Muslims. And they will respect your character if it is good. And your akhlaq and your adab if it is good. And they will be friendly towards you and kind towards you. Without doubt you will find people like that. And even if they are like that to you, and even if they truly love you, and respect you, and admire you, if you take them as your awliya, your friend and protector, that means that when you have a problem in your life, and you go and you seek advice, because from your friend you seek advice, you sit to them and you talk to them about your problems, yes? How will they advise you? From what source of information and from what direction will they give you advice from? Will it be from the book of Allah? Will it be from what the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has said? Will they advise you according to the ruling of the ulama? They do not know the book of Allah. And they do not know the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, nor do they know the rulings of the ulama. So when they advise you, they will say, Oh, Ufra Winfrey had some psychologist who said this and that. And I saw on this TV show, or I read in this book, or I heard something here or there. Or they will advise you from their opinion or their life experience. So even if they love you and they intend good for you, they will still lead you astray. They will lead you astray. They will not guide you with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not guide you with the guidance of Islam. They will guide you with their misguidance and that is what they are upon. So if we as individuals take the unbelievers as our friends and companions and advisors, then Allah has said in the Quran that they will not fail to corrupt you. They will not fail to corrupt you. Again, we repeat it. They will not fail to corrupt you. That means your corruption will be inevitable. If we as nations turn to America and to Europe and to the West for advice, and guidance, be it economic, or political, or military, or any other type of guidance and advice, they will not fail to corrupt us. Because their view of the world is different from ours. For them, this world is the be all and end all. For them, this world is the purpose. This world is the, uh, their paradise. They have directed all of their efforts, mentally, psychologically, even spiritually, to trying to achieve the things of this world. That is why their system, their economic system, is based upon riba. Because to them, all they see is the gain that they can acquire in this world. This is their viewpoint. And why does the Qur'an, what does the Qur'an tell us about riba? Allah he tells us that they say that riba is like trade, it's like tijara. Riba is like trade. This is what they say, only we are trading with money. And really if you think only from the worldly point of view, you will see, and that's what you will think, it is like trade. I have some money, I lend you some money, because you are borrowing my money, you should give me something back. It doesn't seem to be irrational or illogical, only I am trading with money. But what did Allah say? Allah he told us, that but Allah has forbidden riba and He has allowed trade. He has forbidden it. It is evil because Allah has forbidden it. 
and whoever deals in it, he will not stand in front of Allah except as one whom shaitan has made majnoon mad by his touch. He will stand like a possessed person, a babbling fool. Indeed, the one who indulges in riba has declared war on Allah and his messenger. War! Has declared war on Allah and his messenger. Yet you see every Muslim nation and indeed many Muslim individuals have immersed themselves in riba. Declaring war on Allah and his messenger. And the Prophet ﷺ said, on the day of judgment, Allah will give them that person a sword and say, now fight me. And we have heard that there are some people saying, you can take riba to get your first house, that's okay. As long as you don't make it for profit. Subhanallah, where did we find this in the book of Allah? It's okay to declare a war on Allah the first time, as long as you don't do it twice. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, this is how we have become affected. So you see brothers, the mentality of the kuffar and sisters, the mentality of the kuffar, for them, this dunya, they believe by acquiring this dunya and by having the things of this world, you will be successful. They define the successful person to be the one who has acquired the nicest house, the nicest car, the most beautiful wife, the most property, who has got the strongest business, who has got the most power and authority. This person is the successful person. Beauty, fame, wealth. For them, this is the means to success. So they define the successful one as being the one who has acquired those things. This is their mentality. So if we take them as our awliya, they are going to advise us, if you want to be happy in life, if you want to be a successful individual, or if you want to be, as they call, a prosperous nation, a prosperous nation, then you must follow our system. And we believe it. We look at America and we see, oh, look at that. Look at their beautiful cars, their airplanes. They even send rockets up to space. They are prosperous, we say to ourselves. Just like those people from Bani Israel. When Qarun, as we know Qarun, he had an, a body of strong men just to carry the keys for his treasure. So the Jahil people, they said, Oh, look at Qarun. If only we had what he had. If only we had what he had. Because these people, they were ignorant. They only saw like the kuffar, only see the outward of this world. But we know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, as Qaraun was walking, trailing his garment in arrogance and pride, saying, this wealth comes to me because of my knowledge. Then as we know, Allah caused the earth to open and swallow Qaraun and his house and his treasure. Allah, he destroyed him. As he destroyed Pharaoh, as he destroyed Thamud, as he destroyed Ad, as he destroyed the people of Nuh, as he destroyed countless civilizations who were great in power and strength. The Romans, the Persians, the Babylonians, How many civilizations, how many people in their wealth and their power and their armies and their temples and their riches that we cannot even imagine today. Allah has destroyed them and only left ruins and traces for the one who has wisdom and understanding to see what was the end of those who rejected faith. So they only look at the outward appearance of this world. And we Muslims, we look to the West and we say, Oh, how splendid. Look at their wealth and their power. So instead of going to the book of Allah 
And instead of going to the guidance, the pure and the perfect guidance that is in the Quran and that is in the Sunnah, we run to the West and we want to take advice from them and guidance from them. Because we have become ignorant of the reality. And we now, my Muslim brothers and sisters, we think success is what they define as success. And this is the reality. We have become, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, especially us dwelling here in the West, the one who lives with the, perf with the perfume sm seller will come smelling of perfume, even if he doesn't buy some. If you live with the pious and you live with the righteous, even if you yourself are not pious and righteous, it will affect you. It cannot accept. It must affect you. And if you live amongst these people, in the land of these people, where what do we see? Nakedness, drunkenness, disobedience to Allah. Denial of Allah, materialism and atheism and secularism. A people who have dedicated their entire existence to enjoy the pleasures of this world, to satisfy their lusts and their passions, then we will be affected. Even if the coal does not fall on us and burn our clothes, we will smell of smoke. We will begin to smell of it we will become affected by it and so this is our condition brothers and sisters we are Muslims people to whom Allah has chosen us Allah has chosen us Allah has favored us with the guidance of Islam because Allah does not need you to be a Muslim and Allah does not need me to be a Muslim. We are not doing Allah any favors. Wallahi, Allah doesn't need you to pray. He doesn't need you to fast. He doesn't need you to follow the sunnah. Allah doesn't need you to take the believers as your friend and not take the believers as your friends. Allah doesn't need that from you because Allah is al hayul qayyum He is the self-sufficient. Indeed, if all of us the men of us and the jinn of us, the human of us and the jinn of us, if we were all of us to be as the most wicked of the most wicked soul amongst all of us, it would not decrease the majesty and the kingdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not any more than if you took a needle and you dipped it in the sea and you see what is left. If we all disobeyed Allah, it will not make any difference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we all obeyed Allah, it will not make any difference to Him. We are not doing Allah favors by being Muslim. Islam is for our own good. It is only for us, for our benefit. Because Allah, He created you and Allah created me. And He knows what is best for us. Does George Bush know what is best for you? Does Tony Blair know what is best for you? Do the United Nations know what is best for you? Or for mankind? They have written in their charter of human rights. Their, their charter of human rights. Their charter of kufr. Their charter of calling people to rebel against Allah. In this charter, it says that one of the rights of the human being is to choose their religion. One of the rights of the human being is that if they change their religion, they should not be intimidated in any way. They should be left to change their religion and to follow whatever they want. This charter of the human right is in direct opposition to what Allah has revealed. The right of the human being is in fact the opposite of that. The right of the human being is to be pressurized to follow the true religion. That they should be living in an environment 
where they are encouraged or even forced to remain upon the truth that will take them to paradise and keep them away from the hellfire. This is the right of the human being. It is my right and your right and even the right of the non-Muslim that we should take them to paradise as the Prophet ﷺ said even if we take them in chains even if we take them in chains we should take them to paradise SubhanAllah No one would disagree that we should be protected from disease that human beings should be protected from war the human beings should be protected, the women should be protected from rape, the children should be protected from abuse. Because all of these things scar and hurt and destroy the human being. So how about the hellfire? How about the hellfire? Where Allah will burn the skin and recreate the skin and burn the skin and recreate the skin so that the people can taste the punishment. Where the people will be given water that is boiling that will school the faces and burn the insides. How about being protected from that? You see the Muslim realizes that this world is in fact a deception. The believer should know that this world is a very temporary abode. We are here for an extremely short time. That our life is fleeting. It is a moment. We are like travelers who sit under the shade of a tree and then we are on our way. That is the reality of this life. And the things of this world are only there to test us. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور. Allah He created the death and the life to test, to make known, to manifest which of us will will be best in conduct. أحسن عملا and he is Aziz, he is the mighty and he is Ghafur, the forgiving. Who is the best in conduct? Who is the best in conduct? The one who wears the nicest suit from Giorgio Armani. Is that the one who is best in conduct? Who has a nice big smile full of fully dentures? Who has the nice handshake and the golden pen? Who although he smiles in your face, he is stabbing you in the back? Huh? Is this the best in conduct? The woman with her hair is beautiful and her clothes are beautiful. Walking so all eyes turn to her. Is this the one who is best in conduct? No. The one who is best in conduct is the one who is most sincere to Allah who does their deeds not to show off to human beings not because they want people to praise them not because they want reward from the people not because they want money or position or power or fame they only want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they want to please their Lord they want his paradise they want to be saved from his hellfire they want to look at the face of Allah in paradise. These are the people whose deeds are sincere, that are completely free from showing off. They are mukhlis. Mukhlisina lahuddina. And this is what they were ordered with. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَى لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهِ مُخْلِسِينَ لَحُدِّينَ هُنَفَا and this is what they were ordered with, that they should be mukhlis, sincere in their religion. Hunafa, monotheists, worshipping Allah alone, doing their actions for Allah alone. And not only should the deed be sincere, but the deed must be correct. 
Meaning it is not something that you have invented for yourself and you think this is a good deed and in my opinion this is good and in my opinion this is what is good. No, because your opinion is nothing. Your opinion is only the opinion of a feeble human being that came from a small sperm drop that fertilized an egg and you came out not knowing how to feed yourself, not knowing how to clean yourself and then you grew up and you became arrogant and proud and you think you know something whereas in fact you know nothing and your opinion is nothing Wallahi you hear people today say you say to them Allah said and the messenger said and you hear them say well my opinion is how many Muslims you hear them say oh my brother Allah said and the messenger said but I think you think you, th you have an opinion before Allah and His Messenger? SubhanAllah, surely, surely that is the greatest shirk and kufr. That you think your mind, your pathetic mind, and you can compare it to what Allah has said and His Messenger has said. It is not for you or me to decide what is a good deed and what is not a good deed. Or how to worship Allah. Or the means of worshipping Allah. We know how to worship Allah because Allah sent us a Quran to a messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who explained that Quran and he taught us how to worship Allah he taught us how to worship Allah he taught us what are the good deeds and how they should be performed and that is why the Prophet sallallahu said man amala amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa rad Whoever does an action that we have not approved of it, it will be rejected. Whoever does an action that we have not approved of it, will have rejected. Will have it rejected. And that's why the Prophet said, Every innovation is misguidance. Every new thing the people invent, because they invent it. It is not revealed, the Prophet did not teach it. You don't find the Prophet ﷺ doing it. You don't find the Sahaba doing it. How did it become part of our deen then? Who gave this person revelation to tell them this is what is pleasing to Allah. This is how Allah wants to be worshipped. From where did this knowledge come? No, ibadah is tawfiqiyah. Ibadah is from guidance from Allah. If we want to know what is the good deed, we have to go to the Quran and we have to go to the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the good deeds. So our actions have to be correct. It is no good saying, oh, but I was sincere. I did it sincerely. Oh, I, hold, I held a party where there was music and dancing and alcohol and we made everybody pay a ticket of 50 pounds because we wanted to raise money to send it to Afghanistan. My near, my intention was good. We had a good intention. We wanted to help people. A prostitute came to the Prophet and wanted to give money for charity. He said, we don't need your money. We don't need your sadaqah. Intentions do not make things that are haram, halal. Intentions alone do not make deeds good. Not only does your intention have to be good, but your action has to be something that is approved by the Sharia, that is according to the Sunnah. So the person who their deeds are Ahsanu Amala, they have the best deeds, are the one whose deeds are sincere and purely for Allah, and that they are correct. So whoever's deeds are sincere but they are not correct it will not be accepted it will not be written down as a good deed it will be of no benefit in this life or the next and whoever's deed is correct meaning it outwardly conforms to the Sharia and is completely in accordance to the Sunnah in all its details but it is not done sincerely for Allah seeking his pleasure it will not be accepted the deeds have to be both sincere and correct and this is the purpose of our life. 
This is the reason for which we have been created. We have been created to worship Allah. That's the only reason we have been created. This is the purpose, brothers and sisters, of this dunya. This world is only here to facilitate for us to worship Allah, to facilitate us on our journey to paradise, and to help us to avoid the hellfire. It is a ground, a testing ground. A ground where those people who are believers are made known from those people who are disbelievers. The people who are righteous are made known from the people who are sinful. So who are the truly successful ones then? Who are the truly successful people? True success, therefore, my brothers and sisters, has nothing to do with how much money you have, how much power you have, how much authority you have, or how much control you have. Success has got nothing to do with those things whatsoever. The truly successful person is the one who when Allah bestows upon them some bounty, they are grateful to Allah. They are grateful to Allah. They recognize in their heart that Allah has given their bounty to them and they are grateful. And they express gratitude with their tongue. And they use those things in a way that is halal, in a way that is pleasing to Allah. It is not gratitude that Allah gives you money and you spend that money on haram things. It is not gratitude to Allah that Allah gives you a car but you use it to drive to places that are haram. Or that Allah gives you beauty and you display it to strange men. Or that Allah gives you intelligence but you use that intelligence to disobey Allah. That is ungratitude, ingratitude for Allah's bounties. The one who is grateful uses the blessings of Allah in a way that is pleasing to Allah. And they thank Allah with their tongue and with their actions. That person is successful because that person will be truly happy and that person will be truly content. And Allah will give that person more. As for the ungrateful one, Allah will take away from them even what they have. And the successful person, the truly successful person is the one that when Allah tests them, and brothers and sisters, all of us are going to be tested. It's inevitable. Allah has told us, do you think that we will leave you alone saying you believe without testing you as we tested those who came before you? So even the prophets and those who were with them said, when will the help of Allah come? And verily the help of Allah is always near. How sad it is that we see today amongst the Muslim nations that when the people of the world gather together to destroy our brothers who have tried their best to establish Islam in their country, who destroyed shirk, who destroyed immorality, who established the Sharia of Allah, but the nations of the world gathered together in an unprecedented alliance to try and to in fact to destroy that nation. And what did we see from the Muslims? Kufr. They aided the disbelievers in destroying the believers. A clear act of disbelief. A clear act of disbelief. To aid the disbeliever against the believer is a clear act of kufr. And what do we see? The Muslim nations. Allah tested them and all they could think about was themselves. Oh, how will we survive against America? How will we survive? What, are, or what can we do? But isn't the world a testing ground? Didn't Allah say that He will test us? He will test us? Isn't this what Allah promised? To see whether our claim is true 
that we are believers? Subhanallah, if we had all stood together, then what could anyone have done? But we are divided because we are all running after this dunya and we are not concerned in reality about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and reaching the goal of the akhirah. This is the reality. And Allah said, do you think we will leave you alone saying you believe without testing you? Oh, we are the Muslim nation. We are the nation that was established in the name of Islam. Pakistan, that's what they call themselves. We were established in the name of Islam. Subhanallah. And then Saudi Arabia tells us we are the custodians of the two holy places, the land of Islam. How many nations claiming Islam for themselves, but when Allah tested them about something basic, they could not be true to their word. We say, may Allah forgive us and may Allah forgive them. But this is our condition. Why? Because we have really, in reality, lost the true understanding of what is success. We have lost the true understanding of what is success. We think success is to be strong, to have military power, to have economic power. We forgot that success is pleasing Allah and doing what is pleasing to Him. So the truly successful one, brothers and sisters, is that when Allah tests them, they are patient. They have sabr, patience. In their heart, on their tongue, and with their limbs, they are patient. And when they do make a mistake, and we are all going to make a mistake, and we are all going to make sins, then the truly successful one is the one who repents, who sincerely repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this is really success. This is true success. This is the true path to happiness for us individually and collectively. But we have become how the Prophet ﷺ foretold that we will become. And the Prophet said, soon the nations will gather together to take from you in the same way that you invite people to share in a feast. Subhanallah. It's as if the Prophet is talking about today, us now. All of our nations, we are a feast for our enemies. We are a feast for our enemies. They take from us as they like. They, they conspire, and you know, as in a feast, you share, oh, here, you take this bit, this delicacy is for you, here is for you. You see how they conspire together, and together they sit and they take from us. This is what the Prophet said. Soon your enemies will gather together to take from you in the same way that you invite people to share in a feast. And they said, oh, messenger of Allah, this is the Sahaba now, subhanAllah. Oh, messenger of Allah. Is that because we are small in number? They are thinking, how could the enemies of Islam take from the Muslims? It must be in their mind because there are so few Muslims they can't even defend themselves. That's what they're thinking. This was the Sahaba. Because in their mind is that if someone comes to take from us, from Islam, from the lands of Islam, we will fight. We will not let that happen. So they thought, we must be so few at that time, that there's nothing we can do, we're powerless. As they used to be in Mecca, in the early days, there were few Muslims. And it was impossible for them to resist. But the Prophet said, no. You will be many. Like the foam on the sea. You know, one in five person in the world is a Muslim. What, 1.6 billion Muslims on the face of the earth. You know, someone said once, if every Muslim spat on Israel, everyone would drown. SubhanAllah, 1.6 billion Muslims. Huh? Like the foam on the sea. I remember when I made Hajj 
many years ago now. And I went, I wanted to see something. I went to the top of the roof of the Kaaba. And I wanted to see, this is a beautiful thing. I used to see it sometimes on videos. You know when the Adhan is called in Mecca? And you know when the people are making tawaf? And what happens after the Adhan is called? On the outside, people start to sit down. And then the, 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 the circle of people making tawaf gets smaller and smaller and smaller until there's only a few people making tawaf and then just before the imam it stops you know sort of like a you know like the water goes down the drain it's just an amazing sight i just wanted to see it so i went to the top of the roof and the imam was called and i was watching it and there was a brother next to me i think he was from turkey or like egypt maybe he says oh mashallah brother where are you from i'm from england he says isn't this beautiful don't you feel so happy to see all these muslims and I looked and I said, no, not really. So astaghfirullah, brother, what do you mean? I said, you know why? Because when I see all these people dressed in white, and I see the mis millions of Muslims, I remember the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That soon the nations will gather together to take from you in the same way you invite people to share in the feast. Is it because we are small in number, O Messenger of Allah? No, you will be many like the foam on the sea. The foam on the sea, it's white. It's white, yes. And even I saw all the Muslims all in white, and all I could think is the foam on the sea. But the Prophet said, but you will be like the scum, the filth that is carried down by the flood. Just rubbish. Just rubbish. Lots and lots of rubbish. That's what it is. Like the scum carried down by the flood. That's what the Prophet said. And Allah will take the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies. Meaning that the kuffar, they used to be afraid of us. They used to be afraid of Islam, but Allah took that. And now they make jokes about us publicly. Allah will take the fear of you from the hearts of your enemies and into your hearts He will cast wahm. Allah He will put wahm in your hearts. They said, O Messenger of Allah, what is wahm? And the Prophet said, Hubbu dunya wa khashiyat al mawt. Hubbu dunya wa khashiyat al mawt. Love of the life and fear of death because we have become brothers and sisters not people of akhirah we have become people of this dunya we love this dunya like those people who before us Allah said about them that if they were given a life of a thousand years they wish they had a life of a thousand years they wish they had a life of a thousand years who is that? Who did Allah say about they wish they had a life of a thousand years? Who? Come on, you must know. Yehud. Yehud. Yes, the Yehud. And what else did Allah say about them? When they say paradise is for us alone, what did Allah reply to them? You know the Jews, they say paradise is for us. We are the people of paradise. So what did Allah challenge them with? What did He say? Wish for death. Jazakallah khair. He said, wish for death. If you're true, wish for death. If you're the people of paradise, you'd be very happy to die and go to paradise. Why are you hanging around in this dunya? Yes? So brothers, sisters, how about you? You think you're going to paradise? You think you're the people of paradise? Wish for death. Why is death something so terrible to us? <laughs> because we love the life, brothers and sisters, we've become like the Jews. We've become like them. No wonder we can't throw them out of Palestine. What's the difference between us and them? Tell me really. We have become exactly like they were. 
That's the reality. We talk about all the Jews, the Jews, and people give khutbas, and the Jews, and this, the Jews, and the sons of what they call it, the sons of the pig and the swine, and this and that, and we think, oh, mashallah, we can really talk against the Jews. It's all there in the Quran. Wallahi, but really, we look at ourselves, what's the difference? What is the difference between us and them? They think they're going to paradise because they're Jews. And today people think, I'm a Muslim, I'm Turkish, I'm Muslim. I'm Saudi, I'm Muslim. I'm Arab, I'm Muslim. My father was a Muslim who used to pray five times a day. Islam has now become like a national thing. <laughs> become a national thing like part of the flag. Just like the Jews. We love the dunya. We're so attached to it. 1.6 billion Muslims, yet we are the most subjugated people on the face of the earth. We are the weakest of all nations, the most corrupt of all nations. You go to our countries, wherever you go, corruption. Corruption. Injustice, tyranny. Is this Islam? Why is it like that? And how do we change? And how do we survive? It is not, believe me, by revolution and overthrowing the governments, as some people say. Wallahi, that's just a fool's dream. That's another dream of the kuffar. That's what they think. How, okay, you overthrow the ruler and you change the ruler. And what? You still got millions of people who love the life and they fear death. They don't want Islam. They don't want the Sharia. What are you going to do? That's not going to change anything. No, you know, if you want to know how to change, brothers and sisters, if you want to know how to change the world, if you want to know how to make Islam strong, I am sorry to say, you're not going to be able to do it with lots of talking and, you know, you sit there and say, oh, you know, people love to say, oh, the rulers, oh, the this, they want to blame every, oh, the Zionist Masonic conspiracy, oh, the CIA, oh, Mossad. Oh, the Masons, the plotting of the Kuffar. Oh, Israel gets $16 billion a year from America. How can we beat them? That's what you find the Muslims saying. How many Muslims do you find them sit down and saying, we are the ones. It is our sins. It is our disobedience to Allah. It is our weakness of Iman. It is our lack of Islam. We don't say that because at the end of the day, we know that that means a lot of effort. We have to make jihad al nafs. We have to make dawah. We have to change our lives. We have to start giving up the dunya. We have to realize that the akhirah is our goal. We have to sacrifice. <coughs> and that's too much hard work. That's much too much hard work. No, no, no. CIA, Mossad, America, America. And that we keep on talking and nothing will ever change. Wallahi, if you want to blame someone, start right here with yourself. Start with you. Start with yourself. You're the first person and I am the first person I have to blame. Me. My sins. And then let me look at my family. And then let me look at my friends and my neighbors. And let me look at the people around me. This is how we change, brothers and sisters. By starting here right this day. By abandoning disobedience to Allah ourselves. And by obeying Allah ourselves. And by learning knowledge, the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet and implementing it in our lives. And then after that teaching it to others. That is the way we will bring back to ourselves the glory that we once had. That is how we will survive and it is the only way we will survive. Whether it's here in the West or whether it is the Muslim Ummah altogether. And that in reality is what we mean when we say Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhabannar What is the hasana of this dunya? You know what's the hasana of this dunya? Islam. 
Islam is the hasana of this dunya. To be Muslim upon knowledge, to be worshipping Allah. That is the goodness of this dunya. And then inshallah we will get the hasana of the akhirah, the paradise, the beautiful abode of eternal rest. A reward for that which we used to do. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. The first lecture I went to was about riba. Um, I had a mortgage at the time on a house. I'd just become Muslim. So <coughs> I thought exactly what am I going to do? What am I going to live? But anyway, I said, if this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered, Alhamdulillah, it's good for me. So I will obey Allah, and Allah, I know He will look after me. If you do something to obey Allah, and you give something up for the sake of Allah, will give you, Allah will give you something better. So Alhamdulillah, He sold my house, Alhamdulillah. And Alhamdulillah, made quite a lot of money on it, Alhamdulillah. And from then until now, I've been living in rented accommodation. The thing is, brother, is that we have to understand that we think, if we think in the terms of the dunya, we are saying, oh, I'm paying all this money as rent. But what do I have at the end of it? I'm paying rent and paying rent and maybe even, I don't know about here, but in England, the rent is more than the mortgage. If you have a mortgage, you'll be paying less money than renting. So you, you're the, in your mind, the logic tells you, this is, there's no logic to this. I'm working so hard, all my money is going to rent, and I have nothing. But in reality, every penny you spend, you, it's not that you have nothing. Alhamdulillah, you have something better than a house. You have it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you spend money to look for yourself and your family, and to put a roof over your head and you do it in a halal way, this is all sadaqah. This is charity. Every penny you are spending is charity. Every morsel of food you put in the, in the, in the mouth of your wife and your children, it's charity. Looking after your family is charity. So you're not wasting your money at all. Alhamdulillah. You are gaining reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you remember that, what is difficult will become easy. However, that is not that Muslims should not try to improve their condition. So upon the Muslims is to construct a type of scheme. And I've seen Muslims have done that. There are Muslims who have made a scheme by which they agree amongst a number of them to give a certain amount of money every month. For example, if you know you have 1,000 Muslims and everyone gives $10 a month yes you have $10,000 a month after 10 months you have $100,000 so in the first year you have a rota and you do you have it according to the most needy people or you have a system where lots are drawn or whatever and this person gets that money to buy a house and then the next person gets the money to buy a house and the next person gets the money to buy the house this is one way I've seen it happen and I've seen it work the other way is there are ways, halal ways of buying, uh, of buying a house I don't remember the name, they call it Murabaha I don't remember, there's many things that are actually it's difficult because some things they're actually haram it's like halal pig, you know they say it's halal mortgage but it's not halal Actually, it's just riba, but they call it, you know, something else. Yeah, but there is one that is halal. The only one that, the system that I know that is halal is this one. What you can do is the, is the lender buys the house, or you and the lender together. So, for example, say you're the one who has the money, and I'm the one who has, well, we both have money, but I have, I need more. So, I have maybe a few thousand dollars, you have the rest. So, we buy the house together. And the house is divided in shares between your share and my share. And I pay rent to you on your share of the house. 
according to the value of the rent at the time. So if you own 50% or 60% or 70%, then I pay 70% of the standard rate on that house. And then I will buy the house your percentage of you. Okay? So if I have some more money, I will give it to you. Then I own 50% and you owe 50% and I pay 50% on your rent. And then I get more and you now own 25% and I own 70%. So I pay rent on that 25%. This is the only way that I know that is halal to get uh, uh, in lending. It's the only way that I know. And so I, there are some, alhamdulillah, Muslim uh, banks that are doing this now. The only problem is you need a lot of deposit in the first place. You usually need 40%. But you, th you see things are coming. They, they are realizing now that Muslims, they have money, they have wealth, they have income. And for the banks or the lenders, this is a way of them doing business. And it's halal. So you will find, be, have sabr. And the way that is halal will come. But if all the Muslims, they say, okay, we can all take a mortgage now, we can all take riba, then they will not bother to try and make a halal system for us. They want our business. They want it. If we have sabr, they will, according to the needs of the market, provide for the needs of the market. But if we say, and we have muftis giving fatwa left, right and center, all over the place, the first one is halal and this and that, then there is no incentive now for the banks and for the lenders to change their policies to make a halal system for us. And the haram will perpetrate and we keep supporting the haram and we will keep supporting the evil system that exists. This is the problem. No sabr. Allah tests us and we are not patient with the test. If we are patient, Allah will find a way for us without doubt. In England, alhamdulillah, things are changing now. Things are changing. Because more and more people are becoming, alhamdulillah, aware of their deen. And they are refusing to get involved in these things. So then they are now catering for us. So this is what I mean. When Allah tests you, we need to have sabr, brother. Alhamdulillah. And definitely Allah, He will find a way. Zakallah khair. Who was next? He was next to yeah. Oh, sorry. He was the first one to raise his hand. No, he was yeah, the first one to raise his hand. No, they're not. No. Here's a question. Good. Sure. At the end of the day, uh, that's not the issue. The issue is what does the... It is, it is the issue. You, you, yeah, brother, you, brother, I'm not entering into an argument with you. If you're asking me a question, I'm responding to your question. SubhanAllah. Yeah, if you want to go to this, it's easy for me to prove if anyone has knowledge that what I said is right. Okay? For example, open Bukhari, you will find the hadith. That if you find a Jew or a Christian walking down the street, push them to the side. It is well known from what Umar ibn al-Khattab and the Khulaf al rashidin used to implement. That the Jew and Christian was not allowed to ride on a horse when the Muslim is riding on the horse. They will have to walk. Allah, he said in the Quran about the jizya. That you, that fight the people of the book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it's in the Quran. Fight the people of the book and those who do not believe that what Allah has made lawful as lawful and what Allah has made unlawful as lawful until they pay the jizya and feel themselves subdued. The purpose of the jizya is to make the Jew and the Christian know that they are inferior and subjugated to Islam. Okay? In the Muslim state, although the Jew and Christian is free to practice their religion, this is allowed, but they cannot display their cross. And even in the time of Umar, they were not allowed to reconstruct or construct new churches. All of this is to create an atmosphere where the, it is encouraging the people to come to Iman and Islam, not to remain upon kufr and misguidance. 
Yes, there is, we do not force people. We do not say, you must become Muslim or we kill you. That's not correct. But it is from Islam to create an environment where people are pressurized and encouraged to be upon the path of Haqq. And we do not encourage people to be upon the way of Batil. Although the Sharia allows the Jew and the Christian to practice their religion in the Islamic country, it does not encourage it. it does not encourage it. Okay? So these are a few examples. And what you said does not contradict what I said. When we are giving dawah, you are talking about dawah. Abdu ala sabili rabbaka bil hikmati wal What is hikmati? What is hikmah? Hikmah, if you look to the tafsir, is the hikmah is the wisdom, the Quran and the sunnah. This is the hikmah. And the maw'idat al-hasana is to tell them about the hellfire and the paradise and the day of judgment. This is the maw'idat al-hasana. And jadilhum billati ahsanu is to argue with them with proofs from the logic and from the reason. This is actually describing the method of da'wah. So we show them, Allah, he says, the, the messenger says, we tell them about the hellfire, the paradise, the day of judgment, and we give them arguments from the aql. All of this is the method. That does not mean that even by definition this verse is against you. Because Allah is telling, Addu ala sabili rabbaka. That means you call. If you don't, calling people is pressurizing them by the fact that we talk to them and we are saying them Islam is the truth. Here is what Allah said. This is a type of pressure. It's a type of pressure. But if you mean forcing them and, you know, as you said, terrorism. And they, no, of course not. This is not, we do not, uh, you know, uh, say become Muslim or die or something like that, you know. Uh, you know, that of course we agree with you 100%. It's not mean you force them. And the, what is pressure is defined by the Quran and the Sunnah. You understand? It is defined. So there is a limit. There is a limit to it. You know, it doesn't mean, you know, without, you know, anything we can do, get the guy and beat him up and say, right, you become Muslim now. That's not allowed, you know. But we want to create an environment where it is encouraging people to be good. Otherwise, what is the hadood? What is the hadood? Why you chop the hand of the thief? Why you stone the adulterer and adulteress to death? Why do you chop the hand and the leg of the one who commits uh, violent, you know, highway robbery and leave them to bleed to death or crucify them? All of this is to deter the people from being evil and committing evil. Why is the person who drinks alcohol, who is a drunk, whipped 80 times in public? All of this is to deter the people from being evil. Why does the woman wear hijab? This is to deter the, you know, evil of haram sexual intercourse. All of you'll find many things in the Sharia is to create the atmosphere where people can be righteous and it prevents them from doing the munkar. That's all I'm trying to say. Alhamdulillah. Any other questions? <laughs> when you say the, the, the Muslims should not take the Jews and the Christians as Alhamdulillah. That's a very good question. Jazakallah. It's a very, very good question. And I, because I forgot to mention this in my talk. Jazakallah. It's very important. The brother asked, does that mean when, you, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us don't take the Jews and Christians out awliya, that we can't deal with them at all? Absolutely, it does not mean that at all. Indeed, Allah, he mentions that there is no harm, or the meaning of what Allah mentions, that there is no harm that you treat them justly. If you do not find them, uh, you know, um, violent against Islam, or, you know, if you find them not opposing Islam, there's no harm for you to treat them justly and kindly. In fact, no, it's the opposite. As the brother, Jazakallah khair, he said, he quoted the hadith about Abdu Allah Sabiri Rabbaka bil hikmati wal mawidat al hasana so what is our obligation towards them? It does not mean we can't be friendly with them. To smile with them, to be good with them, to invite them for food, to display to them good manners and good adab and good akhlaq. Subhanallah, do we have the best example in the Prophet How about when that Jewish woman used to throw rubbish on him? 
when he used to pass by in the street. Everywhere we all know the story of how the Jewish woman used to throw rubbish on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he used to come. This is in Mecca. Every day she would do it. And then one day the Prophet Sallallahu was walking and he realized that the usual delivery, you know, didn't, didn't happen. So he inquired out of concern about the woman. That was she well? Was she ill? Was something wrong with her? When she found out about this, she said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Only the prophets have akhlaq like this. Because this is the Muslim. We are concerned. We, we have concern for the people. You know, this is our concern for them. So, we, you know, we are told not to be friends with the Jews and Christians because, and, the, and the Mushriks because they will corrupt us. If we take them as advisors, as I already explained, they will not show us the guidance of Allah. They will give us their opinions or whatever. But that does not mean that we should not treat them kindly and be nice to them and advise them and give them da'wah and just display to them good character. No, the opposite. That's exactly how we should behave. That's exactly how, especially us living in this country. Because when I mentioned about the hadith about pushing them to the side of the road, this is not for this place. Do not do that here. Please, that is not the way to understand the hadith. Okay? This is in the Muslim land where Islam is established, is Dara Islam. If you behave like that, they will feel encouraged to become Muslim. Here, if you do that, you will start a fight. And they will think, what is this? No, this is not the way to behave. Here is the opposite. You have to be kind, you have to give uh, good character, you have to give them da'wah. And uh, so, inshallah, to befriend them for that purpose, to give da'wah to them. And that should be the niyyah, to give da'wah to them. You know, or even to take some benefit in business is no problem. Alhamdulillah. It's no problem to do that. So, uh, uh, inshallah, jazakallah khair for that very good and very important question. Let's take two other questions from Al-Brahim. Uh, Mustafa. Uh, first. According to the question of uh, Muslim unity, and uh, a little bit of advice for those Muslims who cannot find a kafir in, but they have to come all the way to the mosque to find a Muslim to oppress. Mm. <laughs> about Muslim unity, we could obviously talk, uh, give a whole nother lecture about Muslim Absolutely. unity. You know. But anyway, unity is based upon Hablillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, Fatasimu bi hablillahi jami'an wa la tafarku. Hold on together to the rope of Allah and don't be divided. The rope of Allah is the Quran, which is explained by the Sunnah. Unity is upon that. And everything which takes us away from that, whether it is your nation, nationalism is something in Islam that is really haram and it is jahiliya. And to whoever calls to nationalism, they call to jahiliya. And whoever fights for nationalism, fights for jahiliya. And whoever dies fighting for it, dies the death of jahiliya. Whoever calls to it, then they call to the hellfire. They will be the inhabitants of the hellfire, as the Prophet ﷺ said, even if they pray and fast and call themselves Muslim. Nationalism is something haram. It divides the Muslims. It is one of the inventions of shaitan and it is one of the means the kuffar have used to disunite us and divide us. It is one of the most divisive philosophies that have ever been invented. And it is so sad to see the Muslim so proud to be of this nation, fighting for their nation, calling for their nation. This is one of the things that has divided us to the extent you see everywhere. Turkish mosque, Arab mosque, Bangladeshi mosque, Saudi mosque, Albanian mosque, a Pakistani mosque, this mosque, everyone's got their own different mosque. You know? And they're not, it's not Masjid of Allah now, it's Masjid Albania, Masjid uh, Lebanon, Masjid Turkey. Subhanallah. And really, it's more than that, unfortunately, because you see the nationalism really obviously sometimes. This is something that has divided us. The other thing that has divided us is different sects and different groups. The Muslims have divided themselves into different religious sects. Diverting from what Allah has said and the Messenger has said. 
And this is all haram and from kufr and from following the ways of the kuffar. Rather, we have to unite upon the book and the sunnah. This is the revelation. Allah did not reveal Islam to the people who invented these sects. Allah revealed Islam to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was best understood by the Sahaba. That is the Islam and that is the true Islam. The other thing that is divided us are the groups as well. The parties and the groups. Unfortunately, we see many people, they try to make a group to, for Islam. Alhamdulillah. But you see, very soon it turns into my group, our brothers, our sisters. This is one of our brothers. This is one of our sisters. What's that supposed to mean? You mean the other one is not your brother and not your sister? And really you will find it's very strange that if someone in your group or your jama'ah is doing something bad and someone in the other group or other jama'ah is doing the same bad thing, you would say, Astaghfirullah, look at that. Look at them doing those things over there. But when your own person in your own group is doing it, you ignore it and overlook it. Why? Is it more haram when they do it and less haram when someone in your group does it? This is the evil of hisbiyah. This has also divided the Muslims. And this is something very, very sad that we see Muslims also very busy and so occupied in attacking each other instead of giving nasiha and advising each other in the nice way that we should Muslims attacking each other, and even though there are so many non-Muslims that we have to give da'wah to, as you pointed out, not to take as an enemy in the sense that, you know, we don't want to think like that exactly, but these are people, they are sick, and they are misguided, you know, they need our help, this is how we should look at it, I think, you know, they are people who need our help, so inshallah, if we were busy worshipping Allah, you know, then alhamdulillah, a lot of these problems would not happen, there's a beautiful saying, I want to finish with that, this saying, saying of Hassan al-Basri, as far as I remember, saying of Hassan al-Basri. He said that when the people get sick and tired of worshipping Allah, they turn to argumentation. You know? So when you see the people arguing, 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 really you will find these are people they got fed up from ibadah. They get up fed up from the thing that will really change and reform the people, and now it's just talk. So really we should concentrate on being worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can we let, let it go? Yeah. And brother, surely every Muslim would agree or Muslims would gain the glory we once had. We have to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through it and follow the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah. The, the way is the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we look and we see our situation, we should not think that it is worse because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one man and the people in Mecca who accepted Islam were very few. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has shown us the methodology of doing that. It's the, the life of the Prophet shows us how a few people who are strong upon their deen can change a great and make a great change. So we should not necessarily always think in terms of numbers and how many people. We need to think of quality, not so much as quantity. And that's what we need to concentrate on. That's why I say it starts with you and starts with me. If you want to change, the best place to start is with yourself. Start by changing yourself. 
So we need to learn about Islam. The first thing is we need to educate ourselves. We need to study the Quran. We need to study the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to study the Sirah. We need to study Islam. When we do that, we will know how to worship Allah. Then we put that into action. Meaning, study is not only, oh, I know all these things now. No, but you must make the action yourself. And then you teach to your family, to your wife, to your children. And then you teach to others who are near you. So the best thing to do, inshallah, and the best way to learn is not really only just by reading books. To find someone who is alim, who is a scholar. And we know there's not many alims. But anyway, alhamdulillah, find someone who has more knowledge than you. Or the most knowledgeable person you can. And learn Islam. Benefit from them. Everybody can make mistakes, but you will benefit from their knowledge, and this is how. And even if it is a little bit, every day, or every week, or even every month, this is the way. Little, 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 alhamdulillah. It seems to be a long, long, long way, but really it is the short way. It is the short way, it's the only way. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, yeah, the Sahaba, most of them couldn't read and write. Most of the Sahaba could not read and write. But they were the most knowledgeable and the most pious and the best of worshippers. And look, their small numbers, in 70 years they, they conquered what most of the known world at that time. So the issue is not even reading and writing or what we call education. The education is to be knowing the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way to know the deen, to know the deen as it is taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, as it taught by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what is important, you know. And this is what inshallah we uh, have to return to inshallah. Uh,